I tried using I prefer not to, and uh, with mixed results, let me tell you. <laughs> Have you, has the seep, I didn't even mean to, it just, it's much like with Bartleby, it just kind of seeped into my... I kind of, I kind of did, I just quit my job. <laughs> <laughs> so that went over pretty well. I prefer, yes. I, ve- I prefer entirely not to. All right, now two things are going on. One, I know that you didn't use I prefer not to when you quit. But two, I would like you to just lie to me forever and tell me in the in the story of you quitting your job, from now on, you did it using I prefer not yeah, to. Yeah, it's just that I prefer not to. I mean, how long is it going to take for me to forget this conversation? Well, you've known me a long time. What are you, two weeks, three weeks? Maybe, yeah. In about a month, I'd like you to tell me the story of how you lost your job and see if I remember instructing you. Uh, my name is Eric. Uh, Michael has been kind enough to join me on the show today. Yeah. Despite my misgivings, uh, we are doing the FP and Hobo with a Shotgun. That's right, we are. Oh my God. Much to I, your chagrin, actually. I cannot wait to talk about these movies. <laughs> I guess we'll get into how that happened. Yeah. But uh, this is a 2011 Canadian exploitation film double feature. Hell yeah. And uh, it's at the, well, the FP, anyways is at the request of listener James Gruesome, who actually owes a, a huge uh, favor to his wife, who uh, funded the show and thusly got the FP on this fine program. Mm-hmm. The FP of these two was the one I was hesitant about, but we'll talk about that. Yeah. In doing so, we're going to definitely spoil the movies and uh, use chapters to skip the spoilers, skip the movies, skip the whole goddamn show. The FP opens, uh, remember we were talking on RoboCop about the Blood Dragon yeah. logos? Yes. Yeah, that is, I, first of all, I didn't know the FP contained any of that. Oh, yeah. Secondly, uh, so here was my fear. Uh, this is, I think this is our opening contender for the, you know, the most wrong about uh-huh. uh, section at the end where I forget about the first 40 movies we did and only talk about the last couple. Right. All of my fears about doing the FP were immediately alleviated. Really? When this, oh yeah, like so, pretty quick. So let me just tell you my one concern. The first time I watched the FP, which was not for the show, I watched it immediately when it was, It was they showed it at the music box. <laughs> and you went? Hell yeah. Okay, so already music box, I'm starting to see. Um, I'm concerned how both of us saw the trailer for the FP and you went, I have to see it opening night. <laughs> and I went, oh my God, let's pretend that didn't happen. Yeah. And you turned out to be right. This is all of the, I'm not winning on any front at this point. My concern within the first five minutes of the FP was um, Pootie Tang. Was yes. do I <laughs> intentionally don't understand what they're saying? Or is this the kind right. of thing? Because- it's it's the dialogue in this film is so fucking wonderful the language becomes its own joke and you never need to understand it to know what they're talking about so you were afraid that the the dialogue would border on approaching you know pity on the runny kind wadata the trailer doesn't sell it i mean i don't think it sells it like it's a comedy uh, I'm not it's impossible to know after you see it because once you see it you get it yeah and then Everything else is tainted, so you can't really go back. Do you think the trailer for a comedy also needs to be funny? I mean, no, maybe that's it. Is it doesn't... I don't think anything about anything like that anymore. Because I also feel like, I guess I feel like the trailer sells it even more straight than the movie does. Yeah. But what tipped you off? Why did you end up actually going to see it other than, well, Music Box says it might be good. It struck me as kind of like a Coat Wolf type thing. The guys that did Bellflower. Uh-huh. It just seemed really fun and independent. Also, L W E just as a character. <laughs> okay, sure. And if you think about when Music Box announces that they're showing something and it, the trailer is something like the FP, mm-hmm. it's either going to be the FP level hilarious or the room level hilarious. Yeah, I see and what you mean. And I wasn't, honestly wasn't sure which one it was going to be because until the very, very final scene, 
right before the end right. credits. <laughs> right. You don't know if it's a comedy. I don't know. I feel tipped off a lot sooner I, than that. I'm not. I mean, I don't. I don't mean entirely, but I mean <laughs> sure. the film and and the greatest it hasn't shown its hand. The till greatest that point. strength of the film for me is the fact that everybody in the film, all the actors, everybody who has to deliver these lines and say never ignorant getting goals accomplished and mean that like that's changing <laughs> yeah, them right nobody ever breaks they don't do the the mike myers say a funny line turd torn the camera and wink they sure. don't even deliver hilarious lines like their jokes well yeah you could err <laughs> on the side of um black dynamite which we talked about all the characters are taking it seriously, but it's hilarious. Sure. However, in Black Dynamite, they'll deliver a line that they know is a joke with kind of the comedic let people laugh around it. Yeah, right. Or they'll deliver a line in a funny way because that makes it funnier. The FP never, ever fails to go through the entire story like it's a fucking drama. Well, sure. There's a scene... Where KCDC is talking about the downfall of a society based on its lack of ducks. <laughs> right. And part of right. me is going, this is hilarious. And the other part of me's heart is breaking. <laughs> well, so I think it's probably funny in the characters and in the premise. And then, uh, you know, the performances just have to commit to those two things. Right. You know, if a bunch of really serious actors uh, weren't tipped off to the joke and came into the movie halfway through given their premise... I think it still ends up kind of looking like this. Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? Sure. Once the premise and the kind of the communities, the character backgrounds, the, um, you know, if you're committed to really representing these characters as they're written on the page, I think that's where the comedy is. And then everything being serious around that, you know, just watching any group of people interact through this scenario sure. is, is going to be pretty fucking funny. Sure. But you mentioned Black Dynamite. I think that's great. It's the treatment in the FP is done with the attention of Black Dynamite. Mm -hmm. And that's something I definitely didn't see. You know, the tacky uh, neon aesthetic throws you off. Right. You have no idea you're going to come into something that has that same, I don't want to say subtlety, but, it, you know... The same gravity. Sure. Uh, with an additional flirtation with social commentary. And the other thing that's so weird about the way that the FP is built is you take the plot and it is one of the most standard cookie cutter plots of all time. And somehow they slightly skew the anchor points of the plot. It's very similar to Black Dynamite where, you know, big government conspiracy, such and such a thing. Right. This film goes on and takes anchor points like well instead of i don't know gang warfare it's beat beat revelation sure and the town the alcohol store in the town is run by a dick so now everybody's turning to drugs right right these tiny anchor points that are normal you get a, a sage master to give you a training montage sure and he can turn disappear i mean the plot is is cookie cutter down to the hero goes off and becomes a lumberjack. Sure. <laughs> well, which also I think is, you know, uh, there's so many Stallone homages oh, yeah. in here. But I love that, you know, everybody rips off Rocky because it's so well known. Mm -hmm. And there's this question that comes up. I mean, you and I faced it when trying to decide how to do Rocky on the show. Um, we watched those movies and the more of them we saw we genuinely liked them. Sure. And I think a lot of people do the Rocky thing just because you can, but what if you want to do an homage to Rocky because you really like Rocky? Yeah. And so watching this, I see so many different pieces of that that aren't the obvious go-tos, that aren't the person who, you know, is making an homage to Rocky who never even fucking saw it. You see um, scenes redone from the later, not even just Rocky, but like the later Rambo films. Yeah. To have a real love of Rambo from later in the fucking franchise, that's some double feature territory. That kind of retired, goes to the mountains, chopping lumber, just living, right. you know, right? cutting logs and stuff. What is it? Uh, logs is chill. Logs is chill. God, I, I don't want to keep harping on the dialogue, but the jokes are so layered in here. It really, you need an extra watch. There's a lot of stuff that, you know, the characters are funny. The dialogue coming out of the characters' mouths are funny. 
And then also just stuff going on in the background is funny. Yeah. There's that scene uh, where they're, when he first comes back to the FP and everyone's drunk and the girl in the background can't fucking figure out how to put her top back on. Yeah. <laughs> and she's yep. just struggling for 10 minutes in the background. Just yeah. can't fucking get it. Well, and the other thing that's, I mean, you, you mentioned that the characters are part of the joke in this film. It's easy to take a film like this and watch it once through and go, yeah, I get it. They kind of wrote off the characters and they're doing a specific. It's it's easy to watch the FP and not realize the level of intricacy that has gone into this film. Sure. I mean, you take a character like KCDC, the throwaway hype guy. Oh, whatever. KCDC is the fucking show for me. That's what I mean. Like these characters could be easily just chucked in there to be you know, kind of a bridge between Jatro and the end of the film. Right. <laughs> right. But instead you get like these in-depth, really cool care. I mean, LWE for me is one of my favorite characters ever in cinema. Sure. But then you get these bizarre cameos from actors that you recognize. There are, there are these, these characters that are really in-depth and then you get these two dimensional, really fucking bizarre cameos from clifton collins jr and frogert right <laughs> right I mean, this is this is an example of how you take a single joke and you just nail it right so many different ways there's no way somebody can do the fp better than the fp <laughs> right. it can't be done well and what you're saying i i think um this is probably a good point to talk about kcdc who uh actually he's um, the actor's name is Art Shu. He was in the second Crank movie we never got around to covering. Uh-huh. But god damn, the FP and Crank 2 would be such a good... <laughs> yeah. I feel like Crank 2 is that same sort of place of uh, tribute and fun as the FP, but doesn't quite know... It's not just making a joke of the genre. It's really trying to hold up the genre as best it can. Right. But man, there are things in this genre. I think the other thing that probably scared me a lot is that um seems like the Fast and the Furious stuff is coming up all the goddamn time on our show. But I know you have not seen the franchise. No. You know, there's two kinds of people in the world, people who have sat through Fast and the Furious 3 Tokyo Drift and people who have not. And uh, this does exist. It's the third Fast and the Furious. And it's not even 80s. It's, it's a fucking recent... It's not like, oh, it was the 80s. We didn't know any better. Yeah. It's probably one of the worst things ever created. Wow. And it's a serious take at the kinds of things, you know, if there would have been a DDR dance battle in the third in Tokyo Drift, you would have, sure. you'd just be like, yeah, this, this is right about the right chapter for this, I guess. Right. But the intensity of DC. So he starts as this, you know, Asian hype man. Mm -hmm. And then when he has to go find Jatro on the farm chopping lumber, yeah, he's still the Asian hype yep. man. <laughs> he's just screaming at him. Across from the softly spoken, just living, you know, sure. farm. <laughs> I just fucking lose it. I mean, KCDC walks around with a microphone and somehow it's connected to a global PA system. But, you know, he tones it down later in the movie. That's the thing I was getting at. Sorry, I know I kind of took the long path there. No, no. But we don't just go, okay, the KCDC character, he yells a lot. He's the hype man. Do that for the whole movie. Right. They keep that up into the second scene because it's funny in that new environment. Right. <laughs> but there are moments where he has to carry a lot of the emotion. Sure. You know, they're talking about his brother and the scene would be funnier if he did different things. And so he does. Yeah. I mean, KCDC leveling, just leveling with Jatro and laying right. it down. <laughs> sure. Is sure. it's one of the funniest possible things that can happen because <laughs> right. because then at that moment. He's still dressed like that. Yeah, right. You know, he still right. is that guy. Sure. It's still absurd. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's a great thing you don't see happen a lot in these old movies. You know, we we think about stuff like Rocky having the characters that have to carry the weight and the characters that become the comic relief. I mean, that was Pauly. Mm -hmm. And I think the Rocky franchise taught us that it's easier to do if you make those separate characters. Sure. But sometimes you do see that especially in a movie where you know you didn't think about it too much in writing it's poorly thrown together it's rushed you sort of just go well i have you know three or four archetypes and i don't have enough people to do this and i don't know whatever just lump them the funny guy he doesn't have a lot of jokes and the serious guy he doesn't have a lot of weight i just make that the same guy i guess sure 
So he is this character that you kind of see uh, littered through these gems of especially the 80s. The FP does this thing that is really fascinating to me. And, and maybe here we go. We're getting into the dangerous double feature territory again. But you and I are two white American males. Sure, here it goes. And uh, the FP deals with some incredibly serious topical stuff. And I mean, I'll get to the the big racism question mark but that's <laughs> sure. after I, I just want to mention things like jokes about abortion abusive fathers oh yeah alcoholism drug domestic I mean, abuse womanizing it's hor- yeah, alcohol it, and drugs i guess are big ones it takes the road through all of those and it manages to just gracefully dance through all of them and go yeah she's getting abused by this freaky father but he's got an electric tennis racket <laughs> what are you gonna do sure but the big thing that this film does, and, and I remember watching it the first time and being really shocked, and I'm not sure how they pulled it off, and I'm not sure why it felt okay for me, but they constantly use racial slurs throughout this film. Sure. And there is not a single black character <laughs> or actor in the entire movie. Now, so the thing for me is I think that that's why it works. I think that by having... An all non-black cast, they can get away with the absurdity of sure. using the kind of racial language that they use. Sure. Does that make sense? Well, yeah, you have a long-standing... Uh, Mel Brooks has talked about that before, about uh, having this relationship with Richard Pryor because he felt like he needed to legitimize some of the racial things he was saying in his movies. Sure. And I think since the days of Mel Brooks, people have picked up on that. That kind of, no, 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 it's okay. See, there's a black guy over there. Yeah. He officially signed off on what we were doing. And this film I think does, we're over that. Yeah, it does the complete opposite. And again, maybe it's offensive to people that aren't you and I, because we're- Privileged. You yeah. can say privileged. Well, That's yeah. Okay. Um, also, it should be pointed out, you and I have never had drug or alcohol problems. Right. As far as I know, you've never had an abortion in your life. No. No domestic abuse Definitely for me. Definitely no domestic abuse. So, uh, so maybe it's it's a little bit backwards for us to sit here and go, it's hilarious and what a great way to tiptoe around racism while still using the <laughs> N-word. But Well, it also makes that stupid arbitrary difference, right? Sure. If you put an A at the end instead of an E-R, you're not using yeah. a racial slur. Well, also, I like the fact that it it goes again this is the fp adding layers and going the extra mile mm-hmm. uh it goes well it's it's different because you're not actually saying it you're saying an acronym it's almost abuseism right i wonder about that question of relatability a lot just in the entire uh the core piece they're making fun of is rhythm based music games and you start watching the movie and you realize that's just an excuse to do the rest of the stuff. Oh, but yeah. at the high concept level, it's the entire icon of the movie. Right. Well, and you get you get these hilarious scenes where Beatro dies playing Beat Beat and there's <laughs> right. no explanation right. as to what's killing him. He's just being Beat Beat revelationed into... Well, he got served, clearly. Right. But yeah. the, the, the music of the those games... It's this type of, I mean, it, it seems to me to be music no one could possibly listen to ever, sure, sure. but it's an entire genre. Yeah. That was a reminder to me as I was watching the movie, you know, thinking about some of these same things you are going, well, I can't possibly understand where every culture is coming from. Some people actually genuinely like the game's music, you know, or that type of club. I mean, does that anyone really hold... A, a mall arcade trance album in their hand and say, here it is, my favorite album of all time. <laughs> I don't think they have to. I think I you, really enjoyed this artist. I think with music like that, I've 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 read and I completely agree. You can just go on iTunes and listen to the 30 second preview <laughs> on loop. I believe that's a full minute now. Oh wow. So I think it's important to note for anybody who didn't know this, because you and I are auteurists and we watch these films wondering who the hell is making them. This is one of the rare occasions we get to watch the people who are making the film in the film. Sure. Because it's it's directed by a new directing team called the Trost Brothers, and they are Jatro and Beatro. Reminds me a bit of Cube. Or, sure. Uh, actually, there's been a lot of those um, independent. 
I mean, you were just mentioning the Bellflower the guys. The Coat Wolf guys, yeah. There's there's a lot of these independent acting, uh, writing, directing, producing, editing teams that are showing up. I wonder if that's a, you know, we've been thinking a lot about this crowdfunding culture. Mm-hmm. It used to be, well, I'll be in the movie because the movie's my, you know, my brainchild and I understand everything. But I also wonder if you don't have to try and create an icon out of yourself as well now. If you're going to look to the internet for your publicity and for crowdfunding, you kind of have to make a name of yourself because you're the artist selling mm-hmm. the project. Yeah. I think maybe that's part of, even if not, um, not consciously, that's part of why we start to see a lot of directors as actors now in independent projects beyond the old reasons of just easy to take the dialogue that I wrote. And, and I mean, that's definitely the case in FP as well. As an experiment, try taking any paragraph of dialogue from the FP and saying it yeah. and sounding natural. I mean, it's, you have to credit their ability to choke out this intentionally terrible dialogue it's nearly impossible to read as if real people are are saying it. Yeah. So maybe they just, you know, it's easier. But I, I do feel like there's also something happening in that scene right now that should be considered in how these filmmaking teams are also, the actors are also at the, at the forefront, in the spotlight. Man, if you want to talk about dialogue that's impossible to say and make work, <laughs> let's move into Hobo with a Shotgun. Uh, I love that they all already had a template for it in their original trailer. <laughs> <laughs> for, the, uh, for the first 10, maybe 15 minutes of Hobo with a Shotgun, the scene before we finally get to see the hobo, uh-huh. before Rutger Hauer steps into frame right. and starts being a character... Uh, it's nauseatingly bad and it's uh, it's uh, and and please for the rest of this segment this chapter of double feature let me say that everything i say about hobo with a shotgun is absolutely lovingly and i think it's a great great film but it knows that the dialogue of especially the drake's two kids oh yeah is horrendous <laughs> and that's part of i mean that's part of the whole idea is that these kids are just absolute terrors, just terrible creatures to have wandering around the world, and the world is far and away better off without them. But it's just horribly written, and anybody who goes into this film <laughs> and watches the very beginning where their uncle gets his head cut off yeah, could easily change the channel, turn off the DVD player, flip to a different Netflix, whatever. Well, the beheading moment is the flip the channel moment. Yeah. I have this feeling that um, I was in a band way back in high school and we did a lot of weird music, Uh but we'd have to play these shows with a bunch of kids who did the pop punk, whatever was popular thing. Sure. And so I would always try and get us to go on last and we would play our most avant-garde song first, knowing it wouldn't work for basically anybody. And we would clear the entire house of people who were going to be on the on the fence through half our set. Uh-huh. I feel like movies uh, have the ability to do that and they don't seize it very often. Yeah. But that's something that we've we've given uh films a lot of a lot of credit for before without realizing what they're doing. That's that moment in Hobo with the Shotgun. The beheading is man, something about it even bothers me for some reason. The manhole sure. uh, beheading it's the level of creativity, but it comes from a really, I don't know, sick, nauseating place. Yeah. But when you're watching it, that's the second to go, hey, just so you know, that thing you just saw, if you're not into that, this movie's not for you. You should yeah. probably bail at this point. Right. And you have to come on strong enough that it's not the, you know, the biggest part of your whole movie that sure. you still have more for the audience. Mm-hmm. But so that you basically go, no one's going to say, oh yeah, I could tolerate that scene sure. and then be turned off by something right. later. Right. There you go. Wow. I really should have known when they took that man's head off that this was not <laughs> the film for me. I think, I think you're dead on there. But what's interesting to me is that I know that that's not what initially turned you off of Hobo with a shotgun. <laughs> you are turned off the very moment they turn the camera on <laughs> no well, with a shotgun. It's funny you talk about the uh, you know the script. It's uh, I submit this may be the worst looking red film ever made. <laughs> <laughs> it's but I mean it's funny you know I, it's all intentional. 
you can't say uh, something like terrible without feeling like you're doing a disservice. But at the same time, I, f I think the only people who would know by terrible we mean perfect is the people who made the film. Right. And it's hard translating that to go, man, we want to make a trashy grindhouse era film. Uh, what should we do? And just throwing together every one of your favorite terrible cinema technique that doesn't exist anymore because we've evolved out of it. Mm -hmm. And then not having something at the end where you go, wow, this is really a piece of trash. I love it. Right. <laughs> you know, there's there's that half second pause that's a deal breaker for a lot of people. But uh yeah, Hobo with a shotgun is a hard spot for me because it makes my eyes bleed. Yeah. I mean that almost literally. <laughs> you know, the same 4K type of footage from this red camera used in the highest quality films today. The subtle palette and tone of David Fincher's The Social Network. And then they put it through this process. It's called Where Technicolor. It, it's shot to look like reversal film. You know, yeah. Technicolor is the, the house treating it. Right. And I mean, I know little to nothing about physical film. It's not something I've wasted, you know, memory capacity on because it was before my time. And I'm of the opinion that digital can do everything and more. So I'm going to go that direction. But uh, reversal film was an alternative to negative film. When you think about film, you think about negatives, mm -hmm. you know, and that, that's the, the very popular format. But uh, by shooting with color reversal, I mean, I know saturation was a big thing, but more so I've always heard it pushed the colors into kind of different directions, different spaces. Mm -hmm. So you could get this look where, you know, there's so many scenes in Hobo with a Shotgun where everything is washed out and say blue. Right. But somehow there are sharp yellow highlights. Right. And I think, you know, this is all post-processed anyways. It's all digital. But were you to shoot that on just normal negative film and throw a bunch of red light into things, it's possible that everything just looks red and it, you know, it just muddies looks up. Looks a little your... bit lighter red somewhere else. Yeah, right. It just kind of muddies up your highlights. Mm -hmm. It just gives you, you know browns and so forth and i've always really liked that look as well of having very distinct different colors you know always talking about how films are afraid of the use of color i guess that's one thing you definitely cannot say about <laughs> hobo with the shotgun i feel like we we rolled right over the grindhouse thing though yeah and while that's probably not news for anybody listening to our show, there might be people who aren't aware of where this movie came from. Yeah, it was, uh, well, I guess anybody from the U.S. might be a little bit more subject to the confusion. Right. Uh, because we didn't get this trailer. We got, uh, what was, we got, did we get Thanksgiving instead? Was that the one we got? I think this was just an additional one. I don't think Canada actually lost it. So you're talking about the the double feature pairing right. uh, known as Grindhouse, which was Planet Terror and Death Proof. Uh-huh came with some fake trailers, and this was not one shown in the States. Right, it was a Canadian trailer for Grindhouse. And as we talked about and as we saw with Machete and as we're going to see later this year with Machete, sometimes those trailers get turned into full films. And then as we didn't see and will probably never see with Thanksgiving, uh, some of those films got talked about and continued to be talked about until The Green Inferno came out. Man, so you're going to you're gonna uh, roll right over Werewolf Women of the SS? <laughs> That's your plan there? I don't think it's happening. You went with Thanksgiving, huh? Um, Buzzkill, Michael. Buzzkill. But this one got made and actually didn't did. follow the machete production style. No, it didn't. It, it changed a lot. Of, well, first off, the, uh, the guy who played the hobo in the Grindhouse trailer is the chief of police. Sure. As opposed to Rutger Hauer, who is our titular character. Right. Uh, well, we get a twofer. Not... We have a high concept title that's also the titular character. Right. You want to talk about some fucking grindhouse. There it is. And the trailer was basically this hobo with a shotgun shooting people. I mean, I guess it, w it had a cleaning up the streets element, but not nearly the depth of cleaning up the streets that this film eventually took on. Had a lot of the same plot points, but more importantly, I think the same dialogue. Mm -hmm. You know, it's funny, you hear Rutger Hauer uh, spitting out this terrible, terrible dialogue and just only half even getting it, you know, this impossibly bad dialogue. And then you think, well, I don't know, did they give him any coaching? Wasn't the director there to say, read it like this? 
not only were those steps probably available, but also there was a trailer where someone had given it a shot before him, Uh but just as poorly. Just to show it is impossible to make this dialogue sound good out of anyone's mouth. Mm -hmm. But I thought it was funny. We talked about Machete being, well, you got to make the movie. You already shot, you know, a third of it to make the trailer. That is not the case with Hobo with the Shotgun. Once you change the hobo from the trailer, you basically have to start over. I mean, at that point, right. all you have is your writing beats. And the title. You don't have any usable footage. Yeah, and the title, which people could argue are, you know, that's part of the package. It's a, sure. a hard part. Um, I want to talk about Rutger Hauer. Let's talk about Rutger Hauer. You know, I know him as Rourke in Sin City. That's always going to be the big Rutger Hauer for me, which will oh, wow. nauseate. Yeah, I know. That's going to nauseate all of our fans. That's insane. I can think of a hundred Rutger Hauer roles. <laughs> I mean, there's <laughs> well, the big one, right? There's the one that we've been not doing. The Hitcher? The original Hitcher? Is that what you were going uh, <laughs> No, I was actually, I was going toward Lady Hawk. <laughs> right. Oh. Yeah. Uh, the Much Requested. Blade Runner. Right. But he's also had a lot of bit parts. I mean, I feel like his career on a whole, he's been incredibly underutilized. Yeah. And that makes him a perfect candidate for this. <laughs> Here you have somebody who is a champion of, you know, underground and B cinema who has potential. Everybody who's ever seen Rucker Hauer in anything goes, man, that guy has a lot of potential. Why doesn't he get put in things? Right. And then finally, you have your own movie, mm-hmm. and you go, man, Rucker Hauer, he should really be put in, hey, wait a second, I have a movie. And so you find this star that is, you know, has potential and is affordable. Sure. And he becomes the champion. Really, I think the piece that ties Hobo with the Shotgun together into a usable, you know, film. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's it's similar to the mechanic with Machete, only mm-hmm. different in that Machete was written for Danny Trejo. Sure. This film, Rutger Hauer, has to own this character. And he does. I mean, this is not an easy character to be. No, no, no. It's not, not an easy world to be in. It's difficult to be the guy who eats glass, then talks about bears, then protects teachers. <laughs> right. And and you're acting opposite uh this character, the Drake who I'm still not sure I get. Right, right. I know that the whole premise of the Drake, and I, I, I love the Drake, and I love the villains in this movie, but there's something about the Drake show yeah, which keeps getting mentioned, yet I never see a video camera, <laughs> right. which leads me to right. believe that maybe... It's a live performance. Right, exactly. And, so, uh, and then we get uh, the Drake's two kids, one of which we've seen on Double Feature at least one time before. Small soldiers. Is Small that soldiers. The one of? Yes. <laughs> and he burns a school bus full of children alive. Slick and Ivan. Fucking. Who have some uh, some road racers shades oh, going yeah. on there. Oh, yeah. yeah. We're mentioning the Rodriguez stuff a lot, but I feel like this is really Rodriguez inspired. Oh, yeah. There's a lot. The way the camera moves sure. from Sin City and the little road racer stuff or the, I think the editing, which is the hardest part to articulate in our limited audio medium so i hate ever bringing up the editing Mm -hmm. but there's something about the editing that gives me a very rodriguez vibe too well also don't forget the plague if you want to talk about rodriguez (laughs) come up with two robots that have really ambiguous badass weapons oh fear not i was going to get to the plague (laughs) but sorry we should just completely uh sidestep the drake kids yeah so so there's Slick, who uh, he's, I mean, he is the worst. <laughs> he is a horrible, horrible human being. And Ivan. And Ivan can't live up to being the worst. It's so funny. And I mean, Ivan will walk around on ice skates and that's not good enough. <laughs> I mean, there's nothing Ivan can do to live up to Slick's horrendous nature. Right. And, uh, and Slick eventually gets what's coming to him. He gets his balls shot off and then dies burning in a ghost bus and another characteristic piece of hobo with a shotgun (laughs) talk about man we're talking about some canadian movies today we discussed plenty of stereotypes in the fp but i feel like canada has a a stereotype for being safe and harmless and lawnmowers over shotguns and we see these two movies coming out of canada today that really have some fucking edge yeah hobo with a shotgun I feel like Edge is one of the best things it has going for it. Mm-hmm. Is it does not give a fuck for half a second who it's going to upset. 
it tries to alienate the audience as often as possible. <laughs> it's going for the niche of the niche audience, you know? Yeah. It's going for a subset of the Grindhouse audience that's even smaller than the sure. original Grindhouse audience. I don't want to gloss over Molly Dunsworth either because she's pretty great, but she hasn't been in a lot of things. Mm -hmm. So uh, hopefully we'll see more of her. She was in something else that Jason Eisner, the director, did. And this guy's actually been getting a lot of work lately. He did two of the big horror anthologies of the last couple of years. He shot a one of the shorts for... VHS 2. Okay. And then he also did, I don't know, did you ever see the ABCs of Death? I didn't see it. Yeah, I haven't seen it yet either. Uh, you accidentally came up with the concept for the ABCs of Death on <laughs> <Yeah>. our show <laughs> years and years ago. Uh, and then Jason Eisner also did this thing called Treevenge. That's awesome. Which is a 15-minute <laughs> short <laughs> about Christmas trees that take revenge. Uh, yeah, just fantastic. So we kill our villains to bring in much better villains in the next act, <laughs> which, uh, which is great because you're, you're halfway through Hobo with a shotgun and you're worried, all right, have we exhausted the idea? Do we, yeah, we get it, it's a hobo and he's mad and he's cleaning up the streets. What are we going to do for the rest of the movie? And this is where you bring in your, I mean, this is the plague. Sure. It's not the high concepts uh, he's, you know, a fast talking hobo and he's mad and <laughs> all of the things that everyone knows about hobo with the shotgun. Sure. The plague is this little secret that they have buried right inside the movie that you don't know about unless you see the movie. Right. And I think it's actually the best fucking part of the whole film. The plague is all predicated on that one scene where they first get the phone call. Uh -huh. Or I guess, no, it's after they've taken the hobo and they're in the plague's house where I don't know. <laughs> flat Chamber. too flat yeah and they have the paintings on the wall you know where i'm going with this oh sure yeah that notion of the plague makes them one of the greatest things in all of film history where they have these pictures on the wall before you get to the pictures though you're not excited about the plague the second you see them anyways well, I, I'm confused by the plague. <laughs> because I don't know if you... I don't know if you, you needed the background in order to get excited. <laughs> well, because they're playing the, the plague video game in that arcade. Uh-huh. And I'm curious if this has some... I don't know. What if it's like the Power Rangers, but not like the real Power Rangers? Like those actors that dress up like the Power Rangers and then they get called in, but it's like Galaxy Quest. I know I just made eight different jumps. I think it's a plague-themed mercenary unit based Maybe. on the highly popular arcade yeah, game. I don't know what's going on yet. The The fact they make 80s synthesizer sounds when they walk doesn't right. tip you off that that's probably not. <laughs> I don't know, They're these blacked-out, unstoppable monsters, which is my favorite kind of cinema monster, is the one that there is no possible way to stop it, and then you're tasked with stopping it. And it's it's kind of... The look, you describe them as robots, mm -hmm. and I think of them more, you know, like some sort of age-old supernatural war. I mean, obviously, the movie gives you that hint of mm -hmm. age-old supernatural warrior, but I have a hard time telling if they're human or organic or completely machine. Well, the thing- It's like a Hellboy creature. Again, there's a clue to that. It's weird how much interesting background the film gives you into the plague, which is just a thing that the film doesn't need. I know, right? <laughs> uh, when when she kills, what's his name, Grinder or whatever, she kills one of the plagues. <laughs> and uh, and the other plague says, she killed Grinder. She must now take his place in the plague. Yeah, sure. Suddenly you realize maybe- these two guys aren't the guys that killed Jesus and Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> right. But some right. predecessor in the plague before they themselves killed one of them. And then you start wondering, well, is it Abraham Lincoln? Did Abraham Lincoln actually right. kill the plague right. and then become part of the plague? Is that why people keep seeing Elvis? So the plague never dies of natural causes. It's right. always assassinated. Right. Which you would think, I mean, something about the ultimate warrior unit uh, they would have to die of natural causes because no one could defeat them. But in fact, I guess they always get old and are defeated by the... Right. And then just carry over the what if steampunk went towards medieval kind sure. of aesthetic. Well, it's the same You would costumes. think one of the people, one, you know, 
you would think Abraham Lincoln would bring on a, a hat or, you know, maybe That's, personalize it in his own way. Guess not. That'd be too campy for this film. <laughs> well, you also see a scene of them fighting a fucking octopus. <laughs> There's just... Hobo with the shotgun is just totally showing off. Oh, yeah. You got it right. They don't need it at all. Yeah. It's completely unnecessary, but it instantly, they're invoking alternate history, and it's opening up this entire universe where you could spend hours speculating on the stories. Yeah. We didn't even really get to say what we were talking about before we jumped right into wild speculation about what is the plague. I feel like by incorporating the plague into your film's universe, and that's a brilliant thing Jason Eisner has done, is now he can put the plague in any of his films. Right. Unite right. all the films within the same universe. Sure. And he can start doing um, the Quentin Tarantino thing where my films are all based on a universe where... Well, you saw what happened in Inglorious Bastards. Yeah, right. Um, right. So we're writing an alternate history. Right. I, I mean, you've already kind of written the alternate history when you see the pictures. You go, okay, well, I guess I can assume right away the plague assassinated all these people. That's the thing it's telling you. But then your mind starts doing the work of, well, what about the official story that I heard for all of those things? Well, How and does who, the plague fit into that? And who hired the plague in those situations? Yeah, who was, right? Who was the Drake to Abraham Lincoln? Sure. And so you get the audience working on that. But then you're right. You could also build in anything else into this universe. Anytime you have an unstoppable hero, sure. you have the more unstoppable plague that shows up. It just leaves so much room for speculation, for expansion, for... Uh, the things that get you talking after a movie. I don't know how anyone could watch Hobo with a Shotgun, claim to not like it, and have nothing to talk about after it when something like the fucking plague happens at the end. Sure. You have to have a conversation about this. You have to go, well, what the fuck was the octopus? You know, <laughs> what are they doing there? Uh, we have a website, doublefeatureshow.com, and an email address, doublefeatureshow at gmail.com. If the colors in one of the movies from today cause you to go blind, uh, send us an email and we'll uh, recoup you for your losses. I wanted to thank Lucas Draval, Enrique, Mike Shaw Dust, and Eric Tachek for uh, they're our executive producers and they made this year happen. Hell yeah. And since they made the year happen, there will in fact be two more movies, as always, next time on Double Feature. Yeah, next time we're going to nerd out and get confused for various reasons. Uh, we're going to do Sneakers and Existence. And it's going to be brilliant. Watch more fucking film. Bye.